suit one may maintain itself for a long time while others are developing beside it. Thus there are always populations which show different stages of development living beside each other on Earth. The first subrace of the Atlanteans developed from a very advanced part of the Lemurians who had a high evolutionary potential. The faculty of memory appeared only in this wilderness among the Lemurians, and then only in the last period of their development. One must imagine that while a Lemurian could form ideas of what he was experiencing, he could not preserve these ideas. He immediately forgot what he had represented to himself nevertheless, that he lived in a certain civilization, that, for example, he had tools, corrected buildings and so forth, that he owed not to his own powers of conception, but to a mental force in him, which was instinctive. However, one must not imagine this to have been the present-day instinct of animals but one of a different kind. Theosophical writings call the first subrace of the Atlanteans that of the Armoaho. The memory of this race is primarily directed toward vivid sense impressions. Colors which the eye had seen, sounds which the ear had heard, had a long after effect in the soul. This was expressed in the fact that the Anmalahos developed feelings that their Lemurian ancestors did not yet know. For example, the attachment to what has been experienced in the past is a part of these feelings. With the development of memory was connected that of language. As long as man did not preserve what was past, a communication of what had been experienced could not take place through the medium of language. Because in the last Lemurian period the first beginnings of memory appeared, at that time it was also possible for the faculty of naming what had been seen and heard to have its inception. Only men who have the faculty of recollection can make use of a name which has been given to something. The Atlantean period, therefore, is the one in which the development of language took place. This language of bond was established between the human soul and the things outside man. He produced a speech word inside himself, and this speech word belonged to the objects of the external world. A new bond is also formed among men by communication through the medium of language. It is true that all this existed in its full useful form among the Armoahals, but nevertheless it distinguished them profoundly from their Lemurian forefathers. The sole powers of these first Atlanteans still possessed something of the forces of nature. These men were more closely related to the beings of nature which surrounded them than were their successors. Their soul powers were more connected with forces of nature than are those of modern man. Thus the speech word which they produced had something of the power of nature. They not only named things, but in their words were the power over things and also over their fellow men. The word of the Armoaho not only had meaning, but also power. The magic power of words is something which was far truer for those men than it is for men of today. When Armoahal's man pronounced the word, this word developed a power similar to that of the object it designated. Because of this, words at that time were curative. They could advance the growth of plants, see the rage of animals, and perform other similar functions. All this progressively decreased in force among the later sub-races of the Atlantean. One could say that the original fullness of power was gradually lost. The Armoahals men felt this plenitude of power to be a gift of mighty nature. 
and their relationship to the latter had a religious character. For them, language was something especially sacred. The misuse of certain sounds, which possessed an important power, was an impossibility. Each man felt that such misuse must cause him enormous harm. The good magic of such words would have changed into its opposite, that which would have brought blessings if you properly your brain grew into the author of new criminal. In a kind of innocence of feeling the Armalaha describes their power not so much to themselves as to the divine nature acting within them. This came among the second subray, the so-called Zulavadu people. The men of this race began to feel their own personal value. Ambition, a quality unknown to the Armalaha, made itself felt among them. Memory is in a sense transferred to the conception of communal life. He who should look back upon certain beasts demanded recognition of them from his fellow men. He demanded that his work be preserved in memory. Based upon this memory of me, a group of men who belong together elected one as leader of kind of creature rank developed. This recognition is even preserved beyond death. The memory, the remembrance of the ancestors or of those who had acquired merit in life, developed. From this there emerged among some tribes a kind of religious veneration of the deceased and ancestor cult. This cult continued into much later times and took the most varied forms. Among the Armalaha, the man was still a keen only to the degree to which he could demand respect of a particular moment through his power. If someone among them wanted recognition for what he had done in earlier days, he had to demonstrate by new means that he still possessed his old power. He had to recall the old work to memory by means of new ones. What had been done was not esteemed for its own sake. Only the second subrace considered the personal character of a man to the point where it took his past life into account in the evaluation of his character. A further consequence of memory for the communal life of man was the fact that groups of men were formed which were held together by the remembrance of common beings. Previously, the formation of groups depended wholly upon natural forces, upon common descent. Man did not add anything through his own mind to what nature had made of him. Now a powerful personality recruited a number of people for a joint undertaking, and the memory of this joint action formed a social group. This kind of social communal life became fully developed only among the third suffering, the Voltex. It was therefore the men of this race who first founded what AA states. The leadership, the government of these communities, was transmitted from one generation to the next. The father now gave over to the son what previously survived only in the memory of contemporaries. The deeds of the ancestors were not to be forgotten by their whole line of descent. What an ancestor had done was esteemed by his descendants. However, one must realize that in those times men actually had the power to transmit their gifts to their descendants. Education, after all, was calculated to mold life through vivid images. The effectiveness of this education had its foundation in the personal power which emanated from the educator. He did not sharpen the power of thought, but in fact, developed those gifts which were of a more instinctive kind. Through such a system of education, the capacities of the father were generally transmitted to the son. Under such conditions, personal experience acquired more and more importance among the third subrace. 
when one group of men separated from another for the foundation of a new community, it carried along the remembrance of what it had experienced at the old scene. But at the same time there was something in this remembrance that the group did not find suitable for itself, and which it did not do it Therefore it then tried something new. Such conditions improved with every one of these new foundations. It was only natural that what is better was needed. Due to the fact that it explained the development of those flourishing communities in the period of the first covering, it tried in theosophical risk. The personal experiences which were acquired sound support from those who were initiated into the internal laws of character development. Powerful rules themselves were initiated, so that personal ability might have full support. Through this personal ability, man slowly prepares himself for initiation. He must first develop his powers from below in order that the enlightenment from above can be given to him. In this way, the initiated kings and leaders of the Atlanteans came into being. Enormous power was in their hands, and they were greatly venerated. But in this fact also lay the reason for decline and decay. The development of memory led to the preeminent power of a personality. Man wanted to count for something so it is power. The greater the power became, the more he wanted to exploit it for himself. The ambition which had developed turned into Mark's selfishness. Thus the misuse of these powers arose. When one considers the capabilities of the Atlanteans resulting from their mastery of the life force, one will understand that this misuse inevitably had enormous consequences. A broad power over nature could be put at the service of personal egotism. This was accomplished in full measure by the fourth suffering, the primal Terranian. The members of this race, who were instructed in the mastery of the above-mentioned powers, often used them in order to satisfy their selfish wishes and desires. But used in such a manner, these powers destroy each other in their reciprocal effects. It is as if the chief were stubbornly to carry a man forward, while his torso wanted to go backward. Such a destructive effect could only be halted through the development of a higher faculty in man. This was the faculty of thought. Logical thinking has a restraining effect on selfish personal wishes. The origin of logical thinking must be sought among the six subrates, the primal semi. Men began to go beyond the mere remembrance of the past and to compare different experiences. The faculty of judgment developed. Voices and appetites were regulated in accordance with this faculty of judgment. One began to calculate, to combine. One learned to work with thought. If previously one had abandoned oneself to every desire, now one first asked whether thought could approve this desire. While the men of the fourth subrace rushed wildly toward the satisfaction of their appetite, those of the fifth began to listen to an inner voice. This inner voice checks the appetite, although it cannot destroy the claims of the selfish personality. Thus the fifth subrace transferred the impulses for action to within the human being. Man wishes to come to terms within himself as to what he must or must not do. But what thus was one within, with respect to the faculty of thought, was lost with respect to the control of external natural forces. With this combining thought mentioned above, one can master only the forces of the mineral world, not the life force. The fifth subrace therefore develops thought at the expense of control of the life force. 
considered was just too visited for these to germ of the further development of mankind. Me. Personality, self-love, even complete selfishness to grow for you. For God alone would work wholly within, and to no longer give direct orders to nature, is not capable of producing such devastating effects as the previously misused power. From this discovery, the most gifted part is selected which survived the decline of the fourth root race and formed the germ of the fifth, the Aryan race, whose mission is the complete development of the thinking faculty. The men of the sixth subrace, the Akkadians, developed the faculty of thought even further than the fifth. They differed from the so-called primal Semites in that they enjoyed this faculty in a more comprehensive sense than the former. It has been said that while the development of the faculty of thought prevented the claims of the selfish personality from having the same devastating effects as among the earlier races, these claims were not destroyed by it. The primal Semites at first arranged their personal circumstances as their faculty of thought directed. Intelligence took the place of mere appetite and desire. The conditions of life changed. If preceding races were inclined to acknowledge as leader one whose deeds had impressed themselves deeply upon their memory, others had looked back upon a life of rich memory, this role was now conferred upon the intelligence. If previously that which lived in a clear remembrance was decisive, one now regarded as best what was most convincing to God. Under the influence of memory one formerly held fast, the thing until one found it to be inadequate, and in that case it was quite natural that he who was in a position to remedy a want could introduce an innovation. But as a result of the faculty of thought, a fondness for innovations and changes developed. Each wanted to put into effect what his intelligence suggested to him. Turbulent conditions therefore began to prevail under the fifth subrace, and in the sixth they led to a feeling of the need to bring the author's thinking of the individual under general law. The splendor of the communities of the third subrace was based on the fact that common memories brought about order and harmony. In the sixth, this order had to be brought about by thought out law. Thus it is in this sixth subrace that one must look for the origin of regulations of justice and law. During the third subrace, the separation of a group of men took place only when they were forced out of their community so to speak, because they no felt the means and the conditions prevailing as a result of. Memory in the sixth bit was considerably different. The calculating faculty of thought thought the new was such, it spurred men to enterprise with a new foundation. The Acadians were therefore an enterprising people with an inclination to colonization. It was commerce, especially, that nourished the waxing faculty of thought and judgment. Among the seven subrace, the Mongols, the faculty of thought was also developed. The characteristics of the earlier subraces, especially of the fourth, remained present in them to a much higher degree than in the fifth and sixth. They remained faithful to the feeling for memory, and thus they reached the conviction that what is oldest is also what is most sensible and can best defend itself against the faculty of thought. It is true that they also lost the mastery over the life forces, but what developed in them is the thinking faculty also possessed something of the natural might of this life force. Indeed, they had lost the power over life, but they never lost their direct, naive faith in it.
this force had become their god, in whose behalf they did everything they considered right. Thus they appeared to the neighboring peoples as if possessed by this secret force, and they surrendered themselves to it in blind trust. Their descendants in Asia and in some parts of Europe manifested and still manifest much of this quality. The faculty of thought planted in men could only attain its full value in relation to human development when it received a new impetus in the fifth root race. The fourth root race, after all, could only put this faculty at the service of that to which it was educated through the gift of memory. The fifth alone reached life conditions for which the proper tool is the ability to think. Or transition of the fourth into the fifth root race. In this chapter we shall learn about the transition of the fourth, the Atlantean root race, into the fifth, the Aryan, to which contemporary civilized mankind belongs. Only he will understand it aright who can speak himself in the idea of development to its full extent and meaning. Everything which man perceives around him is in process of development. In this sense, the use of thought, which is characteristic of the men of our fifth root race, had first to develop. It is this root race in particular which slowly and gradually brings the faculty of thought to maturity. In his thought, man decides upon something and then executes it as the consequence of his own thought. This ability was only in preparation among the Atlanteans it was not their own thoughts, but those which flowed into them from entities of a higher kind that influenced their will. Thus, in a manner of speaking, their will was directed from outside. The one who familiarizes himself with the thought of this development of the human being and learns to admit that man, as earthly man, was a being of a quite different kind in prehistory, will also be able to rise to a conception of the totally different entities which are spoken of here. The development to be described required enormously long periods of time. Hilda Tilda. What has previously been said about the fourth root race, the Atlanteans, refers to the great bulk of mankind. But they followed leaders whose abilities towered far above theirs. The wisdom these leaders possessed and the powers at their command were not to be attained by any earthly education. They had been imparted to them by higher beings which did not belong directly to Earth. Therefore it was only natural that the great mass of men felt their leaders to be beings of a higher kind, to be messengers of the gods. For what these leaders knew and to who would not have been attainable by human sense organs and by human reason. They were venerated as divine messengers, and men received their orders, their commandments, and also their instruction. It was by beings of this kind that mankind was instructed in the sciences, in the arts, and in the making of tools. Such divine messengers either directed the communities themselves or instructed men who were sufficiently advanced in the art of government. It was said of these leaders that they communicate with the gods and were initiated by the gods themselves into the laws according to which mankind had to develop. This was true. In places about which the average people knew nothing, this initiation, this communication with the gods, actually took place. These places of initiation were called temples of the mystery. From them the human race was directed. What took place in the temples of the mysteries was therefore incomprehensible to the people. Equally little did the latter understand the intentions of their great leaders. After all, 
the people could grasp with their senses only what happened directly upon Earth, not what was revealed from higher worlds for the welfare of Earth. Therefore the teachings of the leaders had to be expressed in a form unlike communications about earthly events. The language the gods spoke with their messengers and the mysteries was not earthly, and neither were the shapes in which these gods revealed themselves. The higher spirits appeared to their messengers, in fiery clouds, in order to tell them how they were to lead men. Only man can appear in human form. Entities whose capacities tower above the human must reveal themselves in shapes which are not to be found on Earth. Because they themselves were the most perfect among their human brothers, these divine messengers could receive these revelations. In earlier stages they had already gone through what the majority of men still had to experience. They belonged among their fellow humans only in a certain respect. They could assume human form, but their spiritual mental qualities were of a superhuman kind. Thus they were divine human hybrid beings. One can also describe them as higher spirits who assumed human bodies in order to help mankind forward on their earthly path. The real home of these beings was not on Earth. These divine human beings led men, without being able to inform them of the principles by which they directed them. For until the fifth subrace of the Atlanteans, the primal Semites, men had absolutely no capacities for understanding these principles. The faculty of thought, which developed in this subrace, was such a capacity. But this evolved slowly and gradually. Even the last sub-races of the Atlanteans could understand very little of the principles of their divine leader. They began, at first quite imperfectly, to have a presentiment of such principles. Therefore their thoughts and also the laws which we have mentioned among their governmental institutions were guessed rather than clearly thought out. The principal leader of the fifth Atlantean subrace gradually prepared it so that in later times, after the decline of the Atlantean way of life, it could begin a new one which was to be wholly directed by the faculty of thought. One must realize that at the end of the Atlantean period there existed three groups of man-like beings. One, the above mentioned, divine messengers, who in their development were far ahead of the great mass of the people, and who taught divine wisdom and accomplished divine deeds. 2. The great mass of humanity, among which the faculty of thought was in adult condition, although they possessed natural abilities which modern men have lost. 3. A small group of those who were developing the faculty of thought, while they gradually lost the natural abilities of the Atlanteans through this process, they were advancing to the state where they could grasp the principles of the divine messengers with their thoughts. The second group of human beings was due to gradual extinction. The third, however, could be trained by a being of the first kind to take its direction into its own hands. From this third group the above mentioned principal leader, whom occult literature designates as Manu, selected the ableist in order to cause a new humanity to emerge from them. These most capable ones existed in the fifth subrace. The faculty of the sixth and seventh sub-races had already gone. Astray in a certain sense and was not fit for further development. The best qualities of the best had to be developed. This was accomplished by the leader through the isolation of the selected ones in a certain place on Earth, in Inner Asia, 
where they were free from any influence of those who remained behind or of those who had gone astray. The task which the leader imposed upon himself was to bring his followers to the point where, in their own soul, with their own faculty of thought, they could grasp the principles according to which they had hitherto been directed in a way vaguely sensed, but not clearly recognized by them. Men were to recognize the divine forces which they had unconsciously followed. Hitherto the gods had led men through their messengers. Now men were to know about these divine entities. They were to learn to consider themselves as the implementing organs of divine providence. The isolated group thus faced an important decision. The divine leader was in their midst in human form. From such divine messengers men had previously received instructions and orders as to what they were or were not to do. Human beings had been instructed in the sciences which dealt with what they could perceive through the senses. Men had vaguely sensed the divine control of the world, had felt it in their own actions, but they had not known anything of it clearly. Now their leader spoke to them in a completely new way. He taught them that invisible powers directed what confronted them visibly, and that they themselves were servants of these invisible powers, that they had to fulfill the laws of these invisible powers with their thoughts. Men heard of the supernatural divine. They heard that the invisible spiritual was the creator and preserver of the visible physical. Hitherto they had looked up to their visible divine messenger, to the superhuman initiate, and through the latter was communicated what was and was not to be done. But now they were considered worthy of having the divine messenger speak.